Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. I'm Carol Monley. I'm your host today on Think Tech Global. My special guest is Matt Stone, who's a graduate of the Richardson School of Law, but who's now based in Japan. And he is the CEO of a company called Temenos, Inc. And so welcome, Matt. Well, thanks for having me on the show. We're really looking forward to talking about Temenos, Inc. and what you are doing there. So tell mm. us a little bit about Temenos mm. and the work that you're doing. Sure. Well, I think it's important to mention right off the bat that Temenos uh, started here in Hawaii in 1985. We incorporated and uh, Dr. Irv Rubin started the company and was doing management consulting from here um, around the U.S., particularly on the East Coast, but around the U.S. and, and globally, and in particular places like New Zealand and Australia and Singapore. Um, I joined the company um, roughly five years ago. I took over as COO and now CEO a few years ago. Uh, and um, so now what we're doing is we're still off offering, you know, management and training and consulting, but we're moving in uh, to the next sort of phase of the company's existence. And we do uh, leadership development solutions with both software and data enabled and in-person coaching and training. So your audience are what, organizations sure. and what else, leaders, governments? That's right. Leadership, we usually start pretty high up at the top, but leadership on down to, you know, mid-level management um, in governments and uh, corporations around the world. Okay, so let's, let's dig a little deeper into actually what these um, tools are that uh, Dr. Irving, uh, Dr. Irv Rubin developed. Mm -hmm. What are they called? Well, the tools are built on a behavior model that Dr. Rubin, Dr. Rubin uh, came out of MIT. He's kind of a, I guess you'd call him a guru in the organization development world. And there's some other famous names, um, Dr. McGregor, uh, Doug McGregor, um, and Ed Shine, who's the culture guru. And then there's Dr. Rubin, who was really the feedback guru. And so years and years ago, Dr. Rubin went out to figure out what were the common behaviors, specific observable behaviors, that all people around the world recognized as what he called win-win. In other words, behaviors that when they happen, empower both people in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So he spent years researching it and then he developed a model. And that model is now our source code for all of the solutions that we do. And what, what's the model called? It's called the Rubin 48 Behaviors. Okay, the Rubin 48 Behaviors. That's right. So we're all familiar, many of us are familiar with the Myers-Briggs personality test, right? So this is kind of a, an extension that is going deeper into um, analysis for a broader audience, right? In this case, organizations. Mm. Is that? Well, for many, many years, a lot of the solutions, DISC, MBTI, a lot of, a lot of them are self-assessment based. Right. They're me reflecting on my preferences. And that's fine. There's actually value in that. And that's a great starting point for a lot of people in terms of building self-awareness is starting to think about myself differently. And then, and then as you think about yourself, if we can have a conversation about that, that might help us. But where they kind of stop and where we, we our solutions kind of go the next mile is uh, helping us um, sort of tune our currency, our behavioral currency, the, the words and, uh, that we use and, and the behaviors we associate with the values that are important to us. So um, if we use our tools and our, our model, we can kind of speed up that process and um, allow people to have feedback conversations they would never have otherwise. Okay, so let's, first of all, let's understand what the Rubin 48 is and then how that translates to business, because I understand yeah. that's where Sure. Go. Well, whether it's business or organizations, mm -hmm. you know, now more than ever, uh, communication is cr critical to success. And the issues that we're seeing, and it's going on here in Hawaii, it's going on around the world, is that leaders and teams have to change faster than ever. They have to innovate faster, they have to collaborate, they've got people all over the world, uh, many remote people. So communication is a bigger challenge than it's ever been, and, um, and yet we don't stay in jobs a long, long time to develop the relationships. So what happens is, if I work on a team, I have a set of values. Let's say that trustworthiness is a big value for me, or respect. And you would, likewise, if you're on the team, maybe you're my manager, um, you would also have a set of values. And if we stay at the values level, you say, I want you to act respectfully, for example, 
Well, I might have a different definition behaviorally, behaviorally of what respect looks like in a given situation. And that can be informed by my unique personality, my background, things that have happened uh, around me in my life, just as you would have your own unique currency. So the model is a common language that helps us see if we're on the same page. So the model being, in this case, the Rubin 48. Right. And so describe how that works. How, how, does, that, mm. how does that look? Are there 48 yeah. items? There are. Ah. Uh, actually, what, what Dr. Rubin did is he figured out that there was this common behavioral language around the world. And he would ask people, what kind of behavior do you need to experience to feel like you've had a win-win? Right? And he got all of thousands and thousands of answers from people around the world. And uh, he figured out that there were a lot of commonalities in them, and then he edited them down into 48. And there, there are 24 what we call push behaviors and 24 pull behaviors. Mm -hmm. so, so give us some examples of push behaviors and pull behaviors. Oh, so, um, well, they're broken down into styles. Uh -huh. So each push and pull have four styles each. And in the push side, you have describe, prescribe, appreciate, and inspire. Describe. Describe. Pres mm -hmm. Prescribe. Prescribe. Appreciate. appreciate and inspire. Okay. So for example, describe is about facts. It's about things that are factual. The purest uh, form of a describe would be listening to Spock in Star Trek, if you remember Star Trek. And Spock was always very factual, right? This is what's happening or this is what happened. That's describe. Mm -hmm. So explaining, for example, explaining the bases for your decisions is a describe behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For some people, that's a really important behavior. For others, it's not as important as another behavior. So if we're using our model, whether it's the feedback tool or in the other solutions that, that are derivatives of that, it helps people to point to a behavior and tune their behavior much more quickly. OK, so you're identifying these push behaviors mm -hmm. and then the pull behaviors. How tell us about those. Oh, well, the first uh, style of the pull behaviors is attend. Uh, like what you're doing right now, you're listening to me, you're nodding, you're making me feel like I can push information toward you. So pulling energy is about making it possible and okay for someone else to push information and thoughts and facts toward you. And so attend is the first, first one, it's foundational, it's a gateway. If I'm not looking at you or not paying attention to you, then whatever you're pushing toward me is meaningless. That's right. Me. Okay. That's right. Now there are some cultural things that go on here. So I do, I'm based in Japan, and culturally, the pull behaviors can be very different in Japan. So it's very common for Japanese business people to look down when you're telling them something, to cross their arms and make noises that maybe we not, may not associate with them being receptive. And I learned this years ago that, um, you know, I thought, oh gosh, you know, I'm in this business meeting and someone's looking down and they're not paying attention. Actually, they were, I found out later, they were thinking deeply about what I was saying. Uh -huh. So again, my assumption about behavior is my own. And with our tools, we can more quickly understand where the differences are behaviorally. So that brings up a good point. So you mentioned you know, you, you're in Japan now. You're based in Japan. But of course, your tool is used worldwide, right? So how do you account for the cultural differences in determining um, how to measure somebody's behavior? Well, the beauty is the measurement comes from the person. So the tools that we have really enable a conversation that would be very hard to have otherwise. So it's, it's essentially a catalyst. So if I'm sitting with you and uh, we're talking about how I'm treating you as, as, you know, well, we'll go back to you being my manager. Let's say we have a feedback conversation using our system. We would have a behavior model to look at. And you would be able to tell me, Matt, this is the behavior I want from you more. And from this behavior, I'd like to see less frequency in this behavior. Uh huh. Okay, so now I'm, I'm taking a leap. So you and I work in the same company. Okay, I'm your manager, you're my employee. I have now adopted, or we as a company have adopted Rubin 48, yeah. right? So you're, you're saying that with this understanding of how the tools work and adopting the tools, that you and I can be more productive for our company because I can communicate with you better, you can communicate with me better, and we're on the same page. Boy, that's exactly right. I mean, mm -hmm. we essentially have a, a common language mm -hmm. that helps us accelerate our relationship and move to a high, place of higher trust and understanding. You know, one of the big problems that we have, we all have it, is that no matter you know, who you are, we are operating, because it's biological, on uh, assumptions. Our own assumptions. Our own assumptions. 
about what something means. And we're so often wrong. I mean, <laughs> how many times in your life have you found out later that a behavior that someone did, at work or at home, anywhere, that you took it one way, but actually they meant it a completely different way? Right. Well, I know one thing that I always think about is that, and, and I think it is a Japanese um, uh, uh, style, which is always to nod, which to us in the Western world might mean yes, but really, I, as I understand it, the Japanese, by nodding means I hear you. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily mean I agree with you. That's exactly right. The right. body language of nodding means I'm paying attention to you. Mm -hmm. And then when you say, for example, aso, aso, it's like acknowledging verbally, okay. But it does not guarantee that the person understands even anything you're saying. <laughs> They may or just agrees be, to give you a million dollars for your project or anything like that. You can walk away thinking, wow, we've got a great partnership. <laughs> the deal, deal is inked. And then no, ch no, no deposit is, is made <laughs> into your account, and you're wondering why. Uh -huh. right. So we all have assumptions. Mm -hmm. And so often, the way we treat other people in a given moment is really our own. It's the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Even if I treat you the way I want to be treated, that'll never get us to where we need to be ultimately. I need to understand what you need. Right. So do you have some examples of some major changes that you've seen in the organizations or the people, leaders who've adopted your, your behavioral tool? Boy, have we ever. I mean, you know, we work with um, the Department of Defense at the, at the Pentagon. We do regular trainings there. We, we work with hospital systems and uh, private corporations. And across the board, what we see when leaders use these tools at first, they're a little bit hesitant. You know, many people in leadership have experienced what's called a 360. And a 360, if, if people don't know, is often an anonymous aggregated feedback loop. So here's a leader, and they, and they will interview or poll or survey anywhere from a few people to a lot of people, and then they aggregate this data. So you get this data back, and it says, 22% of the people surveyed think you're horrible in this area, for example. Well, what happens is, is now, instead of probably a lot of valuable feedback that you might get, a lot of times it causes so much fear and anxiety and distrust. In the person the, who is evaluated, That right? the value of that feedback can mm. often not be, ever reach the, you know, reach a point of behavioral change. And so what we see is, as people come to our system, they hear feedback, there's immediately fear. Um, Direct open dialogue, ooh, that can be kind of scary, but then they find out that our model is all positive. We operate on frequency perception and desire for frequency change of positive behaviors, and we have a methodology that makes it a lot easier to have a more constructive, positive conversation. So what happens is, and this just happened literally two weeks ago, we had a leadership team that is using our system and, and, and told us that it has just revolutionized the way that they're communicating with each other. Okay. So, well, so exactly how do they adopt it? So how do they find you sure. and how do they adopt the behavioral tool? Well, we're online. We have lots of connections and friends and partners. It depends on where you are in the world Yeah. Uh, in terms of what, how to find us. What's the feedback tool called? It's called Behavior Tuner. Uh -huh. I think we have a little logo of the Behavior Tuner. Right. So the Behavior right. Tuner, and that is the name of the feedback tool, and how does that relate to the Rubin 48? So uh, like, uh, like all of our solutions, we also have, um, they're similar to an engagement survey that's built on the same Rubin 48 uh, behaviors. Think of the Rubin 48 as our source code. Ah. And we have a suite of solutions that we call behavioral OS, behavioral operating system. Um, and so Behavior Tuner lives on a site called behavioralos.com. And so it's our signature one-on-one -on -one feedback tool and it's used by leaders around the world. And so a lot of times, if we're working with a leadership team, we'll start off by having those leaders do a few uh, feedback sessions with um, other leaders, and we'll debrief them. And we have something called the Relationship 360 Journey, and that's uh, over a three to four month process where we, we do before and after assessments so they can measure the change that happens very quickly. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah. Okay, well, good. Well, we're going to go into a, a break. Uh, this is my guest, Matt Stone, who's the CEO of Temenos, Inc., uh, based out of Japan, but a global company that uh, works with our organizations and leaders in uh, behavioral tools. We'll be right back. This is Carol Monley on Think Tech Global. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. 
Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hello and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing two truths and a lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth and which is the lie. I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone, and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. Welcome back. This is Carol Monley on Think Tech Global with my special guest, Matt Stone, who is the CEO of Temenos, Inc. So, Matt, we were talking about basically how this behavioral tuner works uh, and the Rubin 48. So tell us exactly how now does an organization or a company or a leader who might be interested in learning more about this and uh, how to reach you and how to contact you and exactly what are we talking about in terms of maybe costs and time and follow-up. Wow, okay, that's a big <laughs> bite. Uh, I'll try and tackle those one at a time. In terms of contacting Temenos, we're online at temenosinc.com, temenosinc.com. Of course, you can also reach out to me directly on uh, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Just look for Matt Stone, Temenos Inc. Uh, you probably recognize my my face on there now, so you'll find me easily, and, and um, I love connecting with more people on LinkedIn. So that's a great way, and I'm always happy to talk to people directly. Uh, again, we talk to people all over the world, um, and I'd love to connect with more and more people here in Hawaii as well. We are a Hawaii corporation. This, right. is, this is home, yeah. so we're committed to Hawaii forever and ever. Um, as far as how we work and how we mm -hmm. uh, deliver the solutions, the first thing is the diagnosis stage. So we talk with our clients. It's usually senior management, C-suite level or senior, depending on the size of the organization. They may not have a corporate suite. But, um, but regardless, we, we talk to the top, top leaders. Um, and because leadership sets the tone for everything. So even if they perceive that the problem might be lower down the ranks, it usually needs, there needs to be some, some stuff starting at the top. And then, um, you know, these days everything's about data. Everything's about right. information, right? And we it's want a to, measure of success. That's right. And one of the hard things in, in the learning and development, and anyone working in learning and development knows this, the hardest thing is when clients say, well, we want to, how do we know we're going to be successful, right? So our tools, the way they're designed in and of themselves, gives you data points from the beginning and data points towards the end of a particular journey, so you can actually, at a minimum, you're gonna have some pretty compelling data to look at. And what is the data gonna show? The data is gonna show, for example, when we do a team assessment where we, we, we survey a team based on our model, we ask them about the current state priority given a, uh, given a particular uh, behavior, and then we say what would be the best, the most ideal priority given to that. Can you give us an example? Yeah, so for example, um, you know, uh, explain the basis for our decisions or talk from the heart about your ideals and values. There's another, there's another behavior. So what, if you survey a team, you would find out, oh gosh, of all the behaviors in the 48, this behavior, talking from the heart about your values and ideals, this team is identified, you know, 85% of the team says this should be a very high priority and a majority of members say it is currently a low, low priority. So we look for gaps mm -hmm. in current state versus perceived ideal state. And what that does is it says, oh, we know specifically behaviorally what we could focus on right now to improve engagement, to pr improve the overall health uh, of the culture of a team. And, and about how much time does it take from the time they decide, let's say, to contact you to acquire or purchase or engage with your, with your company to getting the first stage of um, results or data? Yeah. Well, the beauty of having online tools is that we can deploy them really, really fast. The longest period of time is always the, you know, the diagnostic period of what is the problem, what, what is the issue you're trying to solve, and then the approval process. But, but once that happens, mm -hmm. we can move very quickly. Mm -hmm. 
And what we like to do in many cases, and not all, it depends, is we do a survey of a division, a team, of, a, of sort of the pool of people that were mm -hmm. that are at issue. And then we move from group to individual work through Behavior Tuner with the individual feedback uh, assessments that we do through that tool. The beauty is they're both built on the same behavior model, so we have a common language to reference from one th solution to another, if that makes sense. So about what's the size, yeah, you know, do you, from your smallest to maybe your largest um, organizations that you've worked with as you yeah. process through? Yeah, I mean, everywhere from, a, you know, a 10-person, you know, kind of recruiting firm, you know, um, to multi, multi-thousands of people at hospital systems, the U.S. government, where we do training at, uh, I think we're doing Food and Drug Administration, uh, or we just, do, we actually, we just wrapped up a program. Um, I wasn't the one who did it, so. Um, How big's your team, your team in particular? We have a core member of about a half a dozen people around the world, and then we have partners and affiliates beyond that. We kind of have a business model. You know, the, these days in the world, you have to have a networked model. Right because uh, a lot of people are contractors and doing, you know, they're coaches, they're trainers, and so we create opportunities for them to partner with us in using our solution. And generally, is there a, how, how expensive or what's the cost? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I just said that we work with everything from small organizations to big ones, mm -hmm. and I would say along those lines that our pricing is, is really reflects the nature of the issue that we're dealing with. So. If, if a, a company adopts our tool set, for example, and they go through the process of an investment up front, moving forward, the investment goes really low because at that point, all they need to do is buy licenses to access the tools, and then they can use them on their own. So it could be a very low cost after an initial investment, but right. very, very doable, especially when you look at what, what other expenditures that you can make in a learning development space. And what kind of follow-up do you provide to your clients? You know, follow-up um, data analysis, for example, customized aggregated reports, so we can say, gosh, let's look at not only changes over time, but let's look at differences between, in a large organization, between departments. What's going on in the marketing department versus sales versus human resources? And how is the, what's the sort of cultural health of each one? And what, what are the behavioral markers that are different or the same? Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to have a unified culture and to maintain that culture, and yet that's so important for brand building. Right. Do you have any major success stories you want to share with us? Well, we have to. We do have to keep some of them sort of the, the names confidential. Um, that's right. Um, that's really important. But um, you know, we just worked with um, a company recently where their leadership team. There's been sort of an elephant in the room. And they're all really good people. These are executives, and they're all really great people. But they've been avoiding talking about this thing. And they just, it was literally to the point where, you know, you just don't know what decisions are going to get made as a result of, after a while, avoidance leads to some big changes no matter what. That's right. just, there's no Chaos. Other way. Yeah. I mean, people <laughs> leave, right. um, hurt feelings, but it limits our potential to, to build something great together, right? And so everyone has good intent, everyone wants the best, but there's, there's this elephant in the room. And um, we first surveyed the whole team and gave that data. And that, that, the, 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 the CEO of that company uh, called me and said, we're already, this is already helping. Just knowing this behavioral data and, and looking at the behavior, the specific behaviors, not values, but behaviors, helped us ha start talking. Then we moved quickly to individual one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions between them using our system and um, they just, they said it's totally revolutionized. And they're now talking immediately. They started, it, it broke open the doors. Mm -hmm. um, pick your metaphor. Um, but uh, the elephant is in the room, but they're talking about the elephant. And they're moving towards solutions for the future. And all three of these people that were in this core leadership team are, are telling us individually that they're just thrilled with it. Right. So. so how unique is this behavioral tool? Is, is you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the words of a very very seasoned person in L&D in, in New York City who looked at our stuff. Um, we're doing a pilot program for a very very exciting company that's around the country. They're they're very big, and uh, I can't reveal the name right now. But she, after five minutes of looking at the model and the behavioral OS system, she said to me, Matt, I've I've never seen anything like this. This is terrific. This mm -hmm. is what the world needs. Mm -hmm. I want it. So. We're hearing that more and more, and um, it's really exciting time to be working in this field.
Well, you mentioned, you and I talked earlier about going to New York and meeting an author of a particular book. Yes. Right? So I think we have a picture of the book, Insights, right? Oh, Tell yeah. us a little bit about that and how that relates to what you're doing. Well, and, and actually, I went to Denver. Uh, Tasha oh. Yurick, Dr. Oh. Tasha Yurick, is based out of Denver. She's just a tremendous, tremendous uh, mind and a, and a human being. And uh, we connected because I was, um, I was reading her book, um, gosh, maybe a year and a half ago, I forget. And I read it and I thought, man, this is the most terrific book on this subject. It really explains the why of why none of us are as self-aware as we think we are. And how she she talks about she writes about the research that shows that um, you know self awareness is the most important thing to leadership success, and yet here we are and we're none of us. And it's not about how educated you are, how old you are. We're just we're just not as self aware. And the only way to become truly self aware is to have direct, open conversations and honest conversations with people around us. And like, that's the hardest thing to do, because we're all afraid of it, all of us. Right, and it's always important to get an outside, almost, person to come in and help you become self-aware. External information, right. external feedback. We yeah. need it, but none of us, I mean, none of us like to do it. Right. But if we do it, the benefits are amazing, and it leads to more success in business and a happier life. Because let's face it, our relationships are what, that is the real difference maker. Right. It's relationships. Right. Well, I'm going to step back for a moment and talk about your law degree because mm. our audience may not know, Matt was at the law school when I was there uh, as associate <laughs> dean so many years ago. But so how has your law degree helped prepare you for this international business and being based in Japan, um, that skill set that you've developed in law school and I know in your prior uh, work experience, which was in business, marketing, uh, entrepreneurial work. How has that prepared you for what you're doing now? Do we have another two hours? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would never, I will never regret getting a law degree. I also practiced law. I practiced in family law, and actually that comes into the picture a lot, because guess what? It's relationships you're dealing with, and there's a lot of similarities to the issues that go on on leadership teams and in companies, because we're human everywhere we go. But I will say this, Law school and practicing law, and here at Richardson, what, a, what an amazing place to be. There are the relationships that I got here. It's a, it's a diverse place um, where we need to check our assumptions about what behaviors mean, for example. Um, but the legal thinking and analysis is so important today. Being able to understand what are facts and what are not facts, and speak in factual terms, and um, and prioritize things very quickly and, and, and spot the most important issues. I use my legal thinking and skills every single day. Right. Okay. Every single day. So I love Richardson, I love Hawaii. I, I, it's, you know, this is home and it's always great to be back here. Well, we've had a really interesting talk, Matt, and I have a few seconds left and I'm gonna ask you to look into camera four and give to our audience some Parting information about how to either reach you and find out more about Temenos and um, your other last thoughts. Well, thanks, Carol. Um, yeah, do reach out to us at temenosinc.com. That's T E M E N O S Inc.com. And on LinkedIn, um, Matt Stone, you can find me, Matt Stone, Temenos CEO. Um, I really like you know, connecting with, with people. And even if it's just sharing information, um, we want to be of service to the world. So don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, well, thank you. Well, this has been Carol Mon Lee on Think Tech Global with my special guest, Matt Stone, who is the CEO of Temenos, Inc., uh, which is very involved in feedback tools for businesses, organizations, and leaders. Thank you, for so, thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.